Boy, it feels good uh, to get up on Sunday morning and for us to know that we're going to worship God and for us to be together, have time of Bible class, of study, and of praise. And I, I don't know, I, I'm a little emotional this morning too. It feels really good to get up on a Sunday morning and know that the night before you just beat Texas. It really does. It's a new dawn, a new day, and I have a new spirit and ready to preach this morning. I was already excited about this sermon, but it feels even better after last night. I got a couple of things I want to take care of, just some housekeeping things I want to make mention of before we get into the sermon this morning. There are, last week we had our newcomers dinner, and we had actually two families that wanted to place membership with us, and they communicated that with us last week, and I wanted to make sure that they were mentioned this morning. Uh, first of all, Russ and Joanne Boss, and their daughters Autumn and Winter, and they're sitting right up here. Now, if y'all go ahead and stand up so people can see you guys right here, where they're placing membership with us. We're thankful for that. Y'all can go ahead and clap for them too. I'm glad for that. And then we have another family, Wilbur and Mary Farrow, and their children Madison, Will, and Bentley, and they are sitting right back here. Would you guys stand up so that the family can see you as well? Right back here. The other kids may be in their Bible hour. But we are thankful for that. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention as well before... I've got to put my cell phone somewhere else or it'll just bother me the entire time. Hold on. One other thing that's coming up in two weeks, right? Is that right? Two weeks is our family day. Uh, and we are very, very excited about that. Uh, we're thankful that we're going to be able to worship together. Uh, Jason Allman, one of my preaching uh, colleagues, but mentors all at the same time, highly influential in my life and certainly made an influence in me preaching, will be here uh, to preach for us. Uh, the title of the sermon that we've assigned to him that I know he is uh, more than capable of talking about is My Friend I Recommend. The premise is, is if you think about if you think about when you're sharing something with your neighbor, if your neighbor says, boy, you know, my lawnmower is broken. Do you know anybody that works on lawnmowers? Well, sure. My friend, I recommend to work on your lawnmower. Or, you know, who do you recommend for this or for that? You know, I, I need a good doctor or something like that. Well, here's my friend I recommend. When it comes to the gospel, when we talk to our neighbors, oh, man, we've got a friend to recommend. And so I know Jason is going to do a wonderful job. He'll teach in our adult Bible class, which will be in here, and then also uh, uh, for our sermon time uh, at worship at 10 o'clock. So please be inviting your family and your friends to be a part of us that day. We'll eat together right afterwards in our new fellowship hall. So plan to stick around for that. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful day. Uh, I'm very, very excited about it. I hope you are as well. Throughout this year, Matthew and I have sprinkled throughout the year sermons about our apostles and I have really really enjoyed them I don't know if you have as well but we have gotten to know Simon Peter we've gotten to know Andrew we've gotten to know James and John the sons of thunder uh, we've gotten to know Philip and we've gotten to know Thomas and Bartho or Matthew and Bartholomew we've gotten to know James the less and we've gotten to know Simon, the other one, and now, or and then Thaddeus, I keep thinking of the other one, the Thaddeus, and now we get to know Judas. But you know, Judas is an interesting character. You know, if you imagine these apostles, and maybe they're all together, and Judas is one that just kind of was somewhat of an outsider. He shows up to the party, and he really doesn't even want to be there. Matthew has done, Matthew... I'm going to brag on just a minute for a second, okay? I know he hates this, but I've got to say it, okay? Matthew's a great at graphics and stuff like that. He draws things out, and he made a lot of these graphics that we have up here for us. And he emailed this one to me a few weeks ago uh, as a replacement of the original one that he had emailed to me. And uh, I, I asked him about it. Tell me why this name tag here looks all crumpled up and tattered. And he said, well, it's, it's like, you know, they're all going to this party, and Judas doesn't really want to be there, and he doesn't even want to really want to na write his name down. You can just see he just quickly writes his name down, not in very good print. And he, he almost just threw this completely away in the trash, but then he, 
he gets the name tag back out of the trash, and he uncrinkles it, and he goes ahead and sticks it on his shirt, and he walks into the party. That's Judas. Judas struggled. Judas struggled. You could see it on Judas's face. He struggled. But there are some great things for us to learn about Judas. Judas was always the last in the list of the apostles, and it's never said anything good about him. Uh, he's perhaps from this area of Kerioth. As a matter of fact, that name, we call him Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot, that word Kerioth, uh, carries that name, that Iscariot, with him. He's from that area. His father's name was Simon. He's known for his betrayal of Jesus. That's really what we think of when we think of Judas. He's the betrayer. Matter of fact, that's what he's called all throughout the scriptures. Peter is the only apostle that is actually mentioned more times in the Gospels than Judas. So when we're getting to know our apostles, you look for how many times Peter is there. Peter's up there and he's mentioned a lot, but Judas is just the next one in line. Luke and John state that Satan entered into Judas's heart. He entered into Judas. We're going to look at a text here in just a moment from Luke chapter 22 that, that really just plays out this whole scenario for us of what was in Judas' heart. He's described as untrustworthy, being in charge of the disciples' money. That's what Eli read for us just a moment ago. I love that story. That's not even our text this morning. But I love that story because it perfectly paints a picture of what's going on in Judas's life. He was in charge of this money. But he is concerned about this wasted ointment. And the text tells us, not necessarily because, you know, of being able to help the poor, but he was the one that was in charge of the money, and he is the one that ever so often would just kind of help himself to it because he was a thief, is what the Scriptures tell us. The Scriptures tell us that he made a conscious choice to betray Jesus. This morning, we're also going to have a choice, but we'll get there. We'll get there. I want to just stop for a moment and just kind of remind you of exactly why we're studying this. We want you to be able to relate this to your neighbors, to talk. It's just a good talking point to them. But also, while you're getting to know your apostles, you find yourself also getting to know yourself, you. Because you can see little things about each one of these apostles that you can identify with. And you might see some things about Judas that you say, I'm like him too. And I want to encourage you and encourage myself to change and take every opportunity I can to live for Jesus instead of betraying him. So that's what we're doing this morning. We want to learn about Judas, but we want to learn from him as well. What do we learn about Judas that we can say, that's just like me. That's who I am. And I need to do better. That's what we'll discover. First of all, Judas desired financial gain. Go over with me to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. I want to start reading in verse 3 and then stop and talk about some things in verse 5. It says, And Satan entered into Judas, who was called Iscariot, belonging to the number of the twelve. And he went away and discussed with the chief priests and the officers how he might betray them. Verse 5, They were glad and agreed to give him money. Judas was about, all about financial gain. That's really what he was really all about. He wanted that. And if you go back to Matthew's account of, of this, in, in Matthew chapter 26, we see a little bit more of a painted picture for us about this scenario and this dialogue about how they agreed to this money. If you go back to Matthew chapter 26, and starting in verse 14, it says, Then one of the twelve named Judas Iscariot went to the chief priest and said, what are you willing to give me to betray him to you? Judas wanted that financial gain. He wanted to gain something. And they weighed out 30 pieces of silver to him. And then from then on, he began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. 
What will you give me to betray him to you? It's a very interesting question, isn't it? You know, 30 pieces of silver is uh, only mentioned a few times in Scripture, from Exodus chapter 21 and verse 32, when it talks about the price of a slave, but also it's mentioned in Zechariah chapter 11 and verse 12. And here we have in that chapter a painted picture of how this doomed flock of God is... It doesn't have anything to look forward to. And Zechariah is told to take care of this flock, but it's really going to be a flock that just is going to die. Is going to die. And finally, right there, they say, What are you going to, what, that question is proposed with Zechariah. What will you give me for this flock? And Zechariah is prophesying all about Judas and his betrayal. And he says, What will you give me for that flock, that doomed flock? And the 30 pieces of silver is outlined for us. Matter of fact, Zechariah tells, uh, tells us that the way that the, the, the Lord describes that 30 pieces is that it's a handsome price. A handsome price. Sarcastically saying that it's a handsome price. Oh, well, well, we'll agree to that. That seems about fair. 30 pieces of silver. No, that's the price of a slave. Sarcastically, he's saying that. What will you give me? to betray Him to you. Sometimes in our own lives, we do things, even for Christ, for financial gain. And we need to be careful, and reevaluate our lives of what our priorities are and what are our motives. Don't be like Judas and be looking for the financial gain or what you can get out of the church. What you can get out of Christ. Jesus' ministry is littered with times that people came to him looking for something physical. Feeding of the 5,000, healing the sick. They're always looking for something like that. Don't come to the church just looking for something physical. The church is not concerned about the physical. The church, Christ, is concerned about the spiritual. And that's what we come to the church for. Don't come to just see what you can gain from it. Go back over to Luke chapter 22. It says they were glad and they agreed to give him money. And then verse 6. So he consented and began seeking a good opportunity to betray him. What we also find is that Judas desired opportunity. And we think, well, a lot of times we think about opportunity, we think, well, that's a great thing. But I'm looking for the opportunity to preach the gospel. I'm looking for the opportunity to do well in school. I'm looking for the, the opportunity to, you can fill in the blank, good things. Here, this word opportunity, he's looking for a good opportunity to do something evil it almost carries with it a scheming aspect of what his motive was. Looking for an opportunity. And you think, man, Judas, come on. You had all kinds of opportunities. You had every opportunity. Judas is right there when Jesus is feeding the 5,000. He's right there when Jesus is walking on the water, when Jesus is healing the sick, when he's causing the blind to see and the lame to walk. He's right there listening to every sermon that Jesus preaches. He had opportunity after opportunity. And now he's looking for a good opportunity to do something evil. To betray him to them. Don't look for opportunities that are bad. Don't be somebody that sits back in the back and schemes for how you can do something evil. Don't look for how you can weasel your way in for your own gain. Don't look for ways that you can manipulate a situation for your own agenda to be pushed upon others. Those are opportunities that you need to let pass. And the opportunities that you need to be looking for are opportunities to do good. When you've seen the feeding of the 5,000, when you've seen Jesus walk on water and you think I've got to make every use of the opportunity to tell that story 
Don't look for opportunity to do evil. The last one from this passage is that Jesus or Judas desired self-preservation. Keep reading in verse 6. He's looking for this, seeking for this good opportunity to betray him to them. And then I love this. Apart from the crowd. Judas doesn't really... He don't want to cause a big scene. He wants this to be done in secret. As a matter of fact, that's what he does, doesn't he? He waits till at night in this garden alone, and they go and they find Jesus to arrest him while he's praying. A very small little crowd gathers together for that. Judas doesn't really want a big scene. He doesn't want to cause a big scene. He may be embarrassed and ashamed. He just wants to slip around unnoticed and scheming And advocating for his own agenda. Just slipping it in there. Apart from the crowd. Sometimes when we're just looking for self-preservation. We'll say, well listen, it's every man for himself. Yeah, but not in the church. It's not every man for himself. It's not every woman for themselves. It's not every family for themselves. Well, we're just going to do what's best for us. No. You do what's best for for everyone. Paul says that we are to consider others' needs more than our own. And we look for ways that we can lift other people up. Don't look for self-preservation in the church. Look for church preservation. Look for ways that you can preserve the church. And that's a beautiful thought. Judas, oh man, he desired financial gain. He looks for good opportunities. And he looks for self-preservation. You know, I don't want us to stop right there. Those are the three main points, but there's so much more application to this that I really want to drive home for us. What do we learn from Judas' life that helps us to see the big picture? Because Judas didn't see the big picture. He only saw what was in front of him. Very, very short-sighted. What do we learn from Judas's life that helps us to see the big picture? God has a plan that cannot be overcome. Go with me over to Matthew chapter 16. Starting in verse 13. It says, Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, He was asking His disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, But still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But he said to them, Who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then he warned his disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. It wasn't time just yet. He was just teaching them. Now remember, this dialogue that we have here, Judas is present. All these disciples are there and he's asking them, who do people say that I am? And Peter, as bold as he is, steps up and says the correct answer. All, he warned all the disciples. Now keep reading with me. It's easy to just stop right there. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and to be killed and to be raised upon the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke the Lord. Can you imagine? Saying, God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Now he just gave him the keys to the kingdom, right? Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now, just a few words later, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. Isn't it true that in your own life, you go from feeling pretty good to feeling terrible? Doing really well spiritually, but then all of a sudden, you're on the other side of the coin. 
He says, for you're not setting your mind on God's internments, but man's. Then he said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Judas was interested in saving his own life. Self-preservation. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will, a, what will it profit a man? I wonder if Judas' ears perked up when he hears the word profit. What will it profit a man? If he gains the whole world, ooh, and forfeits his soul. Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Maybe 30 pieces of silver. For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and then will repay every man according to his deeds. Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Some. And then there's Judas who hears every bit of those same words. The point is, is that we have got to see the big picture. And it doesn't matter what you do, God's kingdom will always be. Judas hears those same words, and God's kingdom came. And it is here today, and we are enjoying the fruits of all of that labor. Judas may have betrayed the Lord, but the kingdom still came. The kingdom is here. God has a plan that you can't do anything about. It will still be done. Another thing I want us to notice is that we have a choice to make, just like Judas. Go over with me to Matthew chapter 10, and I want you to just think about this for a moment and picture Judas here. Jesus summons, verse 1, his 12 disciples, and he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. Now that is power. Boy, we're going to great lengths to try to figure out how to defeat a terrible disease now. Here these disciples can heal and to uh, destroy any kind of sickness and any kind of disease. They have the power and authority and Judas is right there among them with that same authority, with that same kind of power, with that same kind of ability to do great things for great people. And yet, he made the choice to betray the Lord. You have a choice to make yourself. You have the opportunity, just like Judas, and like every other disciple of the Lord, of how you're going to use this moment in time to lift up Christ and not betray Him. What are you going to do to capitalize upon those opportunities to do great things in the kingdom of God and not waste your life away? What do we learn from Judas? Oh, man. When I look at Judas, I see many things in my own life that I need to correct on. I've got all kinds of things that I can do better. Where I've taken opportunities and just let them go by. And I've also taken opportunities and maybe hurt someone. Opportunities for good and opportunities for bad. Oh, I've got to take every opportunity. And that's what I want you to do. When we are examining our apostles, don't forget... To look at yourself. And here's the thing. This is what I really want you to go home with. Right now, you have an opportunity to have a change in mind on this Sunday morning. Of how you're going to use your life that, was just, that is just as precious as Judas's life was. How are you going to use your life to lift up Christ and not betray Him? You make the choice. Because Christ has given you the ability and the power 
to defeat the sickness of sin. And you have to decide if you're going to use it or not. The other thing that I want to mention, because a lot of times when we talk about Judas, we talk about his betrayal, and we know how the life of Judas ends. Judas felt as if there was no hope for him. Judas felt as if there was no answer for him. And I want to make sure that you know, for those that are here in this room and those that are gathering with us online, that there is never a time in your life where self-harm or suicide is the answer to anything, any problem that you deal with. You can get help. And we can help you. And if we can't help you, we will get you to the people that can't help you. Don't waste your life for yourself. Use your life for Christ. This is one of those times where we would definitely say, don't be like this apostle. Be an apostle, one who is sent, for Christ, who does great things and uses every opportunity for the glory of the kingdom and the glory of Christ. There's someone here this morning that needs to respond. Maybe you've wasted opportunities your whole life and you've got an opportunity right now to come forward, to commit your life to Christ, to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, or you have an opportunity, if you've already done that, to come back to Christ and get right back on track and use this opportunity. for great things for the kingdom. If you need to respond, come as together we stand and as we sing.